Welcome to You and Your Pets. We're here today with a, a great host or a great uh, presence here, uh, Dr. Jay Levenheim, who is the pediatrician that we've had on previously. Unfortunately for us, but fortunately for Mr. Horton, Jim Horton, our regular co-host, he's uh, on vacation and enjoying himself. So we'll try and struggle along just as we are with uh, me as the host and uh, Dr. Levenheim as the guest. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to have you here for a second time. You're the only guest we've had here twice. <laughs> I'm honored. Uh, and I think today, again, as a pediatrician, we'd really like to talk about pets and children and how they interact. Sure. And I know you have uh, children, and so you're well-versed both as a pediatrician and as an adult, uh, uh, adult parent. Um, so tell me, uh, introducing animals to pets. I think that's a real easy place to start. And uh, or animals to pets. I mean, children to pets, or pets to children. So that's a pretty easy place to start. Uh, we have different ages. Well, for uh, a lot of us, our children's first mm -hmm. in introduction to pets are as newborns. Um, and uh, bringing a newborn home to a child where there's a, uh, to a house where there's already an established pet, uh, at times can can be a, a challenge. But there are some ways to smooth the transition. Um, we always recommend, especially for dogs, that mom or dad bring home a, uh, one of the newborn's blankets that the newborn's been wrapped in. Let the dog smell and sniff the blanket before mom and the baby come home uh, to get a sense of the baby's uh, smell and, and so the baby isn't such a strange uh, thing. Also, we always recommend that the um, dog is brought out uh, into the front of the house or apartment uh, to greet uh, mom and the, and the new baby uh, outside the house and that uh, everyone enter the house, including the pet, as, uh, as uh, one family unit. And that helps give the dogs a uh, sense of the idea that this new uh, baby is a, a, a part of the existing family. Those are some excellent points. I think I might add to that there are a couple of scents that we can use in the house to relieve anxiety of a pet. And one of them for a dog is called Adaptil and one for a cat is called feel away and those are two other issues that might come up and maybe we can share as we share sure. medicine we share that also <laughs> so we have the pet now in the house we have a new baby in the house and uh, from my my background and my understanding dogs don't see toddler or young babies as people they scream differently they smell differently and so let's move on now to the next stage do you have any comments on having a toddler or a young walking baby, <laughs> I guess. So toddlers <clears throat> and uh, <throat> young children can be adventurous themselves and a little un unpredictable th uh, themselves. And uh, toddlers are also very curious uh, and uh, sometimes can be a little aggressive, especially towards the a, uh, animal, uh, pet or you know, cat or, or a dog. So it's always a good idea uh, to not leave a toddler and, and your pet uh, alone for any long, long period of time without being watched. Um, and it's good to teach the toddler from a very young age that it's not appropriate to pull or uh, pinch or take food away from, uh, from a pet. Right. I think those are very important points, especially in that a toddler can be in one place in one second and be across the room and over in the dog's food in, uh, yeah, in another right. section. I think from the point of view of a dog, we also have to teach our dogs, um, we have to teach our dogs that food time is food time and they have their place for that mm -hmm. and keep the child separate from that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, uh, of children and pets, separating the pet at the time when they have a bone or they have a chew toy or in the case of cats when they're playing or chasing uh, little pieces of paper or a laser that we not involve the child in those activities where the animal is actually thinking it's doing prey activity. Sure. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's another good point that you brought up. Sure. It, it's also important to remember that uh, for both dogs and little children, the toys can look very similar. And uh, dogs and children <clears throat> can mix up whose toy is whose. And same thing with food. Yes. Yes. And I guess from the point of view of being a veterinarian as opposed to a pediatrician, some food for dogs is not good for children and some food for children is not good for dogs. Absolutely. And I think we've seen issues with that, particularly with uh, 
pig's ears. Pig's ears in particular have been given to dogs and are now recognized to have salmonella on them. And from that point of view, it's the humans that get infected with the salmonella after the pig's ear has been wet. So such live animal or dead animal parts are probably not uh, appropriate to have as toys when you have children and dogs. Absolutely. <clears throat> so at what age, we, we went through the toddler and now we have the six-year-old or the ten-year-old, they have to learn, start learning responsibilities. So as a, as a, as a parent of, I think, your child is five. now five. five. There you go. Five and um, one. Five and one. Um, at what age do you think he can start having the responsibility of doing something for this animal? And at what age do you think you can actually get them to the point where they can take care of these animals? If you're going to buy a dog or a cat or a gerbil for your, for your child. I think it's a, it's a good idea to introduce children to the responsibility of taking care of a pet at a, at a young age. Keeping in mind that you need, need to remember that uh, that child may not be able to fully take care of that pet by themselves and without some uh, parental uh, oversight. Uh, it's also important to, to remember that a child typically can't take care of themselves to at least the age of, of 10. And so if you buy a pet with, a, uh, with the thought in mind that your child is going to take complete con uh, care of the pet, the parent also needs to be uh, aware and willing to take over at, at a time when the pet is no longer a novel toy and uh, may have to do some of the walking and picking up and other uh, responsibilities themselves. Right. And so what responsibilities and what is the hierarchy of, higher, of uh, responsibilities you might give, say, to a 5-year-old versus an 8-year-old versus a 10-year-old versus a 15-year-old? Can you foresee or do you have an idea of what that might be? I mean, it, te it, 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 <clears throat> it tends to matter uh, the, the maturity level of the children at that age. And at those uh, ages, at a five, six, or seven year old child, uh, uh, can have wildly different maturity levels. Um, so you have to kind of match the responsibilities that you're going to give your child to take care of a pet with the maturity level that, that your child uh, um, has. So maybe walking the pet every once in a while. Uh, making sure that the pet is safe and sound in the house. It, it would also depend on, on the nature of the pet. So if it's a good-natured dog, uh, for example, that may uh, not be pulling and trying to run away and what and uh, that type of, of, of activity, then it may, may be okay for your 7-year-old to walk the dog. If the dog is very aggressive or darts at cars or other animals, uh, you may, may want to wait till the child is a little bit older to handle a walk all by themselves. Right, right. And so we talked a little bit before this show, we talked a little bit about the psychological and the social well-being of pets and children. And I grew up with a pet, and it made me, I think, a better person. I'm now a veterinarian. I don't know if everyone would agree <laughs> that's better. But uh, it made me a better person, more caring. What are some of the psychological and sociological implications and advantages of having a pet when you're a young child growing up? Having a pet is, is an excellent idea for a child. It's good for self-esteem building, self-confidence building, and it's also good to learn social skills. Um, we also learn to develop a sense of responsibility and what it uh, takes to care for another, uh, uh, let's say, uh, being, whether it be human being or uh, other kind of being. Right. Um, a child will get a sense of what it takes to ca take care of something and that things need to uh, be watched over and cared for. Right gives you a sense of empathy. Absolutely. I think that's, that's important for children Absolutely. to develop at a young age. Absolutely. And so there are issues and things that can come up, children's health problems, certain children probably are not the best qualified or shouldn't have pets at the younger age or even at uh, the mid-teenage years for certain, for certain reasons. I, I was thinking, and we talked before the show, that diabetes might be one but uh, because of uh, poor wound healing, but you're saying in children that's not an issue. Not typically. <clears throat> not typically. So there are some other things like allergies? It's, it's, uh, if your child has an allergy to uh, certain types of pets, it's a good idea not to introduce that pet into the house, at least without discussing it with your pediatrician and or allergist uh, right. prior to that. So we should probably look for... Uh, well-defined allergies. Absolutely. I know I'm allergic to 
things in the barn, trees, uh, not trees, but hay in, in the barn, but I might not be allergic to the horse itself. Right. Um, and so what other things can we do with pets? We were talking about hippotherapy or riding therapy with mm -hmm. pets. We were talking about um, uh, some therapies that you do with pets and, and, and children. Pet, pets are used more and more these days uh, in hospitals and other healthcare settings, and, and specifically with children with special needs. Uh, for example, children with uh, autism typically respond very well to pets and uh, animals and may fi find a way to bond and communicate with a pet that they have that they struggle to uh, to interact with uh, us as adults or, or um, uh, parents. Uh, so we use pets as a way to communicate with children of, of special needs and to get them to open up a little more socially. Uh, we use uh, horse therapy, dog therapy, and there are all uh, other types of therapy involving children and pets. And so when you say children with special needs, I typically think of the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Are there other areas? Sure, uh, kids with pervasive de de developmental delay, uh, delay, delay, Down syndrome, uh, other, other types of uh, issues. Okay. So there are kids, there are pets, and there are parents. <laughs> and the three have to interact. Um, often, as a veterinarian, I have parents bringing the animals in. And I use that time to instruct the children on some of the health issues that can, that can occur in pets mm -hmm. and animals and children. And we tend to talk about how medicine works and I have to be honest. Do you find that children, when they come into your office, they have much of an understanding about the medicine that you're going to do and about how important it is to recognize uh, some of the things that we see in pets, some of the zoonotic diseases that we, we'll be talking about next half? Uh, children recognize that their pets are sick. They'll, they'll often come in and tell me that uh, prior to coming to me, the, their little dog or cat uh, had to go, go see their vet uh, as well and get sick and get, get medicine just like they did. They, they recognize that uh, dogs and cats and other animals need shots the way they need shots. They're not happy about getting their shots, right. but they recognize that their animal needed, needed the same thing to keep them healthy and safe. And so they can put that together with understanding yeah. a little bit more medicine. Sure. Yeah. So we'll have little pediatricians and little <laughs> veterinarians. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, this has been great. And uh, next, uh, next half of the show, I'd like to delve into some other issues uh, inv involving dogs and pets. But I think we're pushing up against a timeline here for the first half, for the end of the first half of the show. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming in and visiting us at You and Your Pets. And we'll be right back. Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local PEG channels. Welcome back to You and Your Pets for the second half of our show with Dr. Jay Levenheim, who's a local pediatrician and a friend, and we're discussing children and pets, two of my favorite subjects, and I'm sure <laughs> two of your favorite subjects since you have pets also. Um, I'd like to change the focus of this part of the show, and we discussed earlier how children can interact with animals and how parents can interact with children and animals. But now I'd like to change to talk about some of the diseases that pets can get that sometimes are misconstrued as being diseases that pets give to, to children. And maybe Dr. Levenheim can discuss, I think my first topic that we just talked about would be ringworm. Ringworm is a disease we see in dogs and cats and typically it's a circular lesion on the skin and it's often very itchy and there's a hair loss. And we see a lot of owners come in and say, oh my goodness, my kids have it. Can I, do I have to get rid of the dog or the cat? And I think Dr. Lovenheim might want to speak to that issue. The answer is no. Uh, it's not, uh, the sources that we typically see aren't always from your cat or dog. A lot of time it's from uh, sharing a comb or a towel or a hairbrush 
with another kid or, or a family member in the house or outside the house even, or some other place in the environment that they've, they've picked up the uh, illness. Right. Oftentimes it's a, it's a parasite in the soil. And so that being said, if your dog has it, chances are if your dog and your child were outside playing, your child might pick it up from the same source. That's Absolutely. not to say that they share it. Absolutely. Well, there are some other things that I think are maybe a little bit more pressing in terms of uh, significance, and one is parasites. Now, fecal parasites are something that we were taught in veterinary school were important in that they can be transmitted to humans. Um, but realistically, I, I, I don't know what the incidence is of that that you see in your practice. Um, and would you like to comment on that? Uh, fecal parasites and poop in the backyard and wherever. I think the incidence that I see in my practice is relatively low. Uh, however, the danger of these things uh, still does exist. Um, I recommend to all my patients uh, lots of hand washing for many reasons, but especially after cleaning up uh, after your pet before and before eating. Um, and before putting your hands near uh, your mouth. It's also very good advice to give, give uh, your patients and my, my patients the idea that they should pick up after their, their animals' uh, soil and to be careful letting children play in the same part of the lawn that the animals soil in. I, I agree 100%. I think I try and express to my clients, because my patients never listen to me, <laughs> but I try and express to my clients that it's important to try and isolate the, the pet in one part, wherever that is, of the yard, clean up right after them, and avoid contamination of the entire yard. Absolutely. So that's, that's something that we have to look at. But you really don't see a lot of significant disease from parasites of animals being transmitted to humans. Thankfully not. Okay. So then another issue, and we talked about this on the last time you were on, were ticks. And I think dogs and cats tend to act as a sentinel for ticks. If our dogs and cats are coming in with ticks, they're out there, and chances are our, our kid patients, our child, children patients, sure. and adult patients can also pick them up. And they're walking through the same places. They're walking through the same places, and, they're, and ticks are indiscriminate. Now, not all ticks are going to give you disease, but the infected ticks that do bite you will give you disease. And so what is your advice in terms of uh, uh, protecting ourselves if our dogs are coming in with ticks? What should people be doing? I mean, they talk about tucking in the socks and wearing long sleeves. Do you have other uh, advice? Yeah, I think if, if you're going to bring your children through areas, especially with tall grass or wooded areas, it's a good idea to wear high socks, long sleeves, and long uh, pants. It's also a good idea after being uh, in an area like that to check your children uh, that night or before getting a bath uh, that day uh, to check their whole body for, uh, for ticks. And you have to check the, the whole body because ticks can be hidden in funny places. Yeah, I, it's the same thing with dogs, funny enough. I mean, this is becoming more and more one medicine. As, as we say, both physicians and veterinarians are coming together more often. But we look in the groin area, in the folds of the skin, mm -hmm. in the folds of the buttocks, I would imagine, for children, mm -hmm. and the armpits and around the hairline. And so that's, that's a very common place. Sure. So our dogs and cats can act as sentinels when we have disease uh, around. So then we have dogs, we have disease, we have kids. So prevention? Uh, bug spray that has uh, the ingredient DEET, D-E-E-T, in it is good good for preventing and using uh, tick treatments for your dogs. It's good, good treatment also. Right, right. And so we talked about pig's ears earlier. There are pig's ears and there are other types of treats that can pass on uh, diseases to our pets, not directly, or to our children, not directly, but through the use of these, um, these treats. So one of the diseases that came up was E. coli. Now I know E. coli is not common E. coli, the kind of E. coli that causes children's problems is not common in dogs and cats, but is common in cattle. Mm -hmm. And so even though we talk about dogs and cats on this show, we do realize that some of our, some of our people might go out to farms and go out to uh, horseback riding stables and or, be in contact. Or petting zoos. Or petting zoos, and that's an excellent point. So hand washing again. Hand washing is key for most of these things. So you'd say everyone should hand wash all the time. Constantly. Constantly. <laughs> I wish you were there when I was a kid. 
So then the, one of the things that I think may affect adults but does have an implication for children, although I don't think it's common, is toxoplasmosis. And I like to warn people that in a situation with toxoplasmosis, the most likely place they're going to be exposed, well, two most likely place, is undercooked meat. Mm -hmm. And the second is their cat's litter box. Now, I think we tend to be involved with our cat's litter box much more than we tend to eat undercooked meat. But this is a disease that I've seen can affect uh, children or mothers of uh, child-bearing years um, and pregnant women. And so can you speak to the issues related to those? Uh, yeah, a, uh, a woman while she's pregnant who's infected with toxoplasmosis can cause some pretty severe infections in the, in the newborn. Um, that can create a various group of problems. Um, so we do re do re recommend that pregnant women, uh, the, the best they can, avoid changing the litter box themselves uh, to avoid being in, in, infected. Yeah, I, I've had many an argument where I've asked the husband to change the litter box and <laughs> the wife says, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, so guidance now. If we have children and our children are... Uh, tender age of 5'10", and we want to get a dog in. Um, do you advise that people come by and discuss that with you? I always recommend before people get a dog or a cat or any pet, if they want to come by and sit down with me for five minutes, I'd be happy to discuss that with them. Sure. I think it'd probably be a reasonable thing for them to get guidance from their pediatrician as well. And do you have any guidelines that you use to discuss we try and individualize it to the family, to the child's personality uh, as well, different guidelines that, that, that we use. Um, but I think it, it certainly is a good idea to, to talk to your pediatrician uh, prior to, to introducing something like that into your, your household and to uh, help answer some of the questions and concerns you may have. Right. And so beyond the zoonotic disease, zoonotic, and I should have explained this earlier, zoonotic disease is one of those diseases that can be spread from animals to people or from people to animals. But beyond zoonotic disease, if we want to discuss something else, it's an unfortunate issue that some dogs are not as friendly as they maybe could be. And some dogs have grown up without the benefit of being exposed to children. And so one of the biggest things you told me that you see in your practice are bite wounds. Mm -hmm. Bite wounds and, I guess, scratch wounds from cats. Yeah, and punctures. And, and punctures. And so what kind of precipitating events do you think uh, might cause these? Are you, I mean, you see it in your practice. Do you have a feeling well, there for are, that? There are all different scenarios that they, they happen in, but it typically happens in either a dog being over-aggressive and misinterpreting an action of the child or a child being over, over aggressive with an animal and the animal feeling threatened or vulnerable and uh, feeling that it has no situation, uh, uh, no way out of the situation the except to, uh, to bite or scratch or do something to try and remove itself from the situation it, it's in. So uh, from my perspective as a veterinarian, when I look at an animal, I see danger signals when they're eating when they're playing with toys, I mean, I think those are two areas sure. that we really have to be careful of. I see danger signals when a toddler can't really control his movements and is likely to trip over a dog. Sure. Um, I see other danger areas where the dog is hyper excited or the cat is hyper excited. And we sometimes see that when a cat is sitting in a window and looking outside and seeing other animals going by. That's not the time to pet animals. That's the time that Sometimes, if an animal is excited, will bite. Uh, a lot of the bites uh, and scratches that I see in dogs that uh, the family did not expect an incident to occur or was certainly caught off guard happen when uh, the animal is actually trying to be playful or is just a little too, too excited and doesn't realize that the child is more fragile than uh, the adult it's used to playing with. Right. And then, of course, we see the, the disasters now. Your dog, Marty, who's a little Bichon, <laughs> Uh, is a little bit smaller than my dog Mishka and my other dog Freckles, but my dog Freckles is 60 pounds and my dog Misha is about 65 pounds. And when they get up ahead of steam and decide to run, stay out of their way. And I see, I can see injuries occurring like that. I've seen that both, in my practice. Both, both my kids have been knocked over many times by Marty. My little Marty. But it works both ways. They've knocked him over plenty of times as well. <laughs> 
So, the, so those are the things that I think we have to consider when we talk about children. Beyond everything else we considered, I think the benefits are much outweigh any of the possible uh, frailties or possible um, side effects or possible problems that you might have by having children and pets together. Absolutely. I think that it's important as, a, as an adult and as a, my daughter is now grown and left home, but having children and pets together is very, very important. And I think it gives them all a, a very good background. Uh, pets learn to be adaptive and children learn to be adaptive. But it looks like as if we need some words of wisdom from Dr. J uh, <laughs> as to uh, maybe what you see as the best benefits for children with dogs and maybe the best way to ensure that you get the most out of your pet. Well, I think we kind of t we touched, touched on it before a little bit, but dogs can be a great source of, of comfort and uh, empathy for uh, children. Uh, they build uh, self-esteem and self-confidence in, ch in children and show them a, a sense of, of, of responsibility. Um, and I, I think uh, having a pet and a child for most children uh, is much more of a benefit than any sort of negative. That's very good. I think there's one point that I want to bring out and that is that feral cats, feral dogs will use the bathroom in, and raccoons will use the bathroom in your backyard. So anytime you have children's play areas, please go out and inspect those before your child goes out and play. Well, it looks like we're almost at the end of the program now, and I'd like to offer our listeners, if they have any questions, feel free to contact me at maplewoodah at comcast.net. If you have questions, you can email me. I will pass them on to Dr. Levenheim. But I think we're at the end of the program right now, and I'd like to thank you for watching You and Your Pets. I'm your temporary host, Dr. Ernie Rogers, and we have our pediatrician guest, Dr. Jay Levenheim. Thank you. <laughs>